is enough, and it's time for a change. Are you ready? It is Sunday, and you're listening to the Sunday Segway Wrestling Podcast. And give me a hell yeah! If you're from Ooh, yeah! With Kenny Killer. Hey yo! We're in the big, big life, baby! And we are live! Woo! I'm the Gaudem Sugar Shoe. The best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be! Cause that's the bottom line! Hello, Seg Heads. It's your boy, Kenny Killer. You know how we do, trying to bring you the best interviews in pro wrestling, as we do um, every week. And now I am very, very happy to have uh, with me today um, the man of the hour when it comes to progress wrestling. That's right. He is the messiah. It is Jim Smallman. How are you doing, Jim? Mate, that's like the best build-up ever. <laughs> like... Like nobody's ever introduced me as the Messiah, like ever. Um, I'm I'm good, thanks, dude. How are you? I'm I'm great. I'm just you know very happy that you've given us this opportunity uh, to you know speak with you and and let the the segheads out there and the British fans you know um, listen to your words. Um, so we're gonna start off very very simple. Um, where did you grow up? Because I'm not sure a lot of you know a lot of um, our listeners probably don't know where you where you grew up. Um, well, I mean, as a company, like Progress is, is from London, so everyone presumes I'm from London, mm. uh, but I'm not. Uh, I live in Wales, I live in North Wales, and I am uh, from Leicester, um, which is my uh, incredibly hard-to-place accent. <laughs> no, one knows, no one knows what a Leicester accent is. It's this. <laughs> this is what it is. Um, so um, did you get a lot of local wrestling out there growing up? No, I mean, I went to watch... Uh, I mean, I'm 37, and I went to watch... British wrestling, uh, I went to see like an all-star show when I was maybe eight years old at a, at a venue called Granby Halls in Leicester, which is has long since long since been destroyed. Um, but, but that was pretty much my exposure to live wrestling until I first went to a WWE show when I was maybe twelve or thirteen. Okay. So, it, yeah, there wasn't it wasn't like there was there was loads around. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and, and certainly because of me growing up during the, the television decline of British wrestling, it, it did mean that I wasn't I wasn't really aware of British wrestling that much until uh, and, until I, I came to sort of start a company, which <laughs> makes it is, is kind of a, a weird way of looking at it, I suppose. Yeah, well, I mean, my my upbringing in wrestling is pretty much the same. British wrestling for me, you know, at the tail end of you know world of sport and stuff. And uh, mm. yeah, so um, you know, giant haystacks and all those names were just you know kind of um, there. There were not much coming out of my mouth, you know. I was the Ultimate Warriors and so on and so on. So, um, but with that said, what was your earliest wrestling memory then? My earliest wrestling memory is watching World of Sport when I was probably four or five. So you're talking like 1982, 1983. And I used to stay, used to go to my grand's every weekend and my grand would have it on and she, you know, she quite liked it. <laughs> so uh, I, I just remember sort of watching it. I remember the first match I ever watched, um, I am 99% certain had the Dynamite Kid in it. <laughs> and and I, I, I remember watching like these two very, uh, whoever his opponent was that day, these two very sort of quick, uh, talented wrestlers. And I remember watching that and thinking, I can get on board with this. This stuff's good. And then the next match was a Big Daddy match. And I remember even at the age of four or five going, it's not for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so even at that age, I was a, a quite a, a tedious work rate fan, even at, even at a, very young, uh, a, a very young age. But, uh, and, then, and then I don't remember, really remember watching much else vividly. I remember it always being on on a Saturday afternoon. Um, but then I started going to football and things like that. And I don't really vividly remember watching stuff again until... I was, I'm going to say 11 or 12, and and all of my friends were all of a sudden into, as it was at the time, WWF. Mm-hmm. And that was a point where I went, 
I uh, really like this. <laughs> it's brightly, it's brightly coloured and it's quicker, it's faster paced, and this is something I want to get on board with. And then loved it again until I was maybe fourteen. Then I remember there being a point where I switched off from wrestling and didn't like it. And that very specific point um, was uh, me watching. Uh, an Undertaker match and Vince McMahon as the commentator as he was at the time saying on commentary this one line that made me not watch wrestling for four or five years he just said we're not entirely sure if the Undertaker is alive or dead <laughs> and, uh, and as a, as a, in my early teens I just remember going nah I'm nah, not watching this not and me. then didn't watch it again until um, I was flicking through Sky Sports one day when I was at university and I saw Mick Foley being thrown off the top of a cage and then I all of a sudden just went back and collected everything I'd missed in the meantime mm -hmm. and started getting obsessed with with stuff from Japan in the mid-90s and, and tape trading with people in America, as, as you had to do at the time, because really the internet really wasn't that big a deal. And it, yeah, it sort of, from that point onwards, I was a, a fan that, you know, I, 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 there's never been a point where I've stopped liking it since that point. It's always the way they're getting into it, you know. You never have it in your house. It's your nan or your uncle, you know. You can you kind of go, mm. go around the house and you watch it. You know, your parents tell you you should be watching that, and then that's the way it goes. It's it's ironic how there's a lot, especially a lot of British guys um, that kind of do it that way. Um, did you yeah, ever? I think you're right. Did you I, ever? I, want, sorry, carry on, Jim. No, no, no. I, I think I do think you're right. I think it's it's especially because of the reputation British wrestling had in the 1980s. So. It, 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 it had that reputation where people weren't necessarily sure if it was a work or not, and and then all of a sudden it was exposed in the Sun newspaper, and and it became a thing that. But like I remember my dad's attitude towards wrestling before I was involved in the industry, and now he gets it and, and enjoys it and watches our shows, which is cool. But when I was a kid, he was very much like well, it's rubbish, isn't it? And it was only my gran who really really liked it. It's, it and, I, and I, I'm certainly not the only person who was like that. Whereas now, you know, I have a 12 year old daughter. She turns around to me and goes, Dad, can we go to the wrestling? I'm going to go, Yeah, of course. You know, That's it's quality. It's it's, it's definitely it's definitely changed with the generation I feel. Yeah, I mean, I know I know a lot of friends that have like Jamaican nans and they're in there like, you know, cuss, um, cussing at the TV at yes. Sh Seamus, you know what I mean? Bro kicking everyone, that kind of thing. So um, in their strong Jamaican accent. So yeah, <laughs> you could imagine how funny that, that, that would look. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, did you ever want to be a wrestler at any point? Yes, I nearly trained as well. Ooh. And when... It's not something I've been... I, I get asked a lot of questions in, in interviews that I've answered a lot. And and it's because... as the I mean, there's three of us involved in Running Progress, and I'm the public face of the company, so I'm the one who tends to do all the interviews, and, I, and I, I'm used to answering them. And it's... This is not a question, weirdly, that I've been asked very often. Um, um, so I'm going to reveal something that... that people won't necessarily know and that is um i'm a stand-up comedian that's my real job that's mm -hmm. what i do most of the time and um that's why i'm sat in a travel lodge at the minute <laughs> doing this interview that's that's why i'm never home and all that sort of stuff and the first thing i ever did that involved writing was i remember being at university and being really into wrestling and i looked into I, at that point i was you know, I used to run cross country and stuff like that, so I was I was pretty physically fit. I'm not very big; I'm only like five ten. So, um, and I remember thinking, oh, this is maybe something I could go into, um, but being very shy, like too shy to actually go to training. Like I was so shy that like stuff like going to the gym used to freak me out. Mm. So that was never really going to be on the cards, which is a bit of a shame. Um, so I got into something uh, called e wrestling, which is where you come up with a wrestling character. Ah, yeah. And then you write the promos for that character. And I was really good at that because it was creative writing. That's what I was doing at university. It's mm. like it wasn't and and that made me think about wrestling in a different way and became made me become even more fa uh, fascinated with what happens behind the scenes. It's why nowadays you know, people often if I'm involved in a in a storyline within progress, people are always like, "Oh, you're going to you you're going to wrestle then." Absolutely not. Because I, I admire everyone who's got the talent to do the wrestling. I I've at our wrestling school I've taken two bumps I landed on my head for both of them and we qu we quickly realised that a man in his mid-thirties is not coordinated <laughs> enough to all of a sudden become a wrestler it's not going to happen um, I, I don't want to I want to leave that to those guys but I, that was the point where I fell in love with the, the the background workings of wrestling but there was a point where I was I was sort of doing that e-wrestling stuff and enjoying it and it was taking up quite a lot of my my sort of free time 
and obviously it's never going to pay anything or lead to anything. And when I sort of quit it and I got a, re a real job when I was 22, I remember thinking, oh, you know, that's just something I leave in the past until I was a I required to write storylines and promos like <laughs> I am now. Um, but yeah, it was. It, there was a point where I remember emailing um, CZW's wrestling school, um, which, especially bearing in mind the sort of wrestling I enjoy, mm. would, have been, would have been a weird choice. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to, that's it. I'm going to go. I'm going to move out to, I'd already been to America to watch wrestling. I'm going to move out to Philadelphia and train to be a wrestler. Um, and let's all be thankful for the world of wrestling that I never did <laughs> and never ruined a card that anyone had paid good money to go and watch. Oh god, I could just see it now. CZW, here comes Mr. Smallin. You could just imagine. Oh mate, it would have been <laughs> wrestling yeah, names, man. Wrestling names. Fun. What would have? What you must have come up with some wrestling names, man. Well, weirdly, um, when when we started Progress, um, the, the world's the world's funniest in joke is that when we started, because we're such a small company, like there's three of us that run the company, and with the exception of a, a couple of people who help out with a few bits and bobs, like we've got a couple of cameramen. And we've got a couple of people to help with with merch related things. That's it. We don't employ anybody else because mm -hmm. we don't trust anyone else to do it. Yeah. So when we started, we we film the shows, and then I go to to my business partners are John and Glenn. I go mm -hmm. to John's house. John does most of the day to day stuff and is is the true genius behind our company. And and I'd go to John's house and I would record the commentary, but I never felt I could record the commentary as myself. Um, so I'd record it as a, as a man called Jimmy Barnett, which was my e-wrestling character name, yeah. which I don't think I've ever told anybody. So, um, so yeah, so I'd go and I'd do, I'd do it like that. And then when we realised that we do so many shows now, I haven't always got time to get to London, and uh, we wanted the shows. The, the com I I wasn't a massive fan of doing the commentary, so we wanted the, the commentary to um, to feel better. So now it's done by RJ Singh and. and mm -hmm. um, and Glenn Joseph, my other business partner, mm -hmm. um, we when we realised we were going to do that, we decided to sort of we decided to future endeavour my fictional alter ego, <laughs> which I don't like, and we did it knowing that everyone knows it's me, or so we thought, because some people didn't know it was me and were genuinely sad, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the one who updates our website. So oh, like, I'm I'm writing a thing about oh we you know we wish you all the best for these future endeavors and it's like <laughs> and people were like oh missing me had quite you know quite a nice sort of um, viewpoint on it. it's like no it's me <laughs> it's me I'm messing about oh. so um, so that would have been my name because I have literally no I'm, I have no sort of imagination for names <laughs> I don't think I've ever been involved with giving any of our projo students a name either and mm -hmm. it's for the best I, I trust. I trust John, uh, John and Glenn with names, but made storylines, yeah. Coming up with finishes for things, yeah, I'm good at that. But no, no, not names. I'm yeah. terrible. Yeah, leader. Oh, and also, in my head, my finisher would have been some kind of ridiculous off the top rope, <laughs> jumping inverted brain buster. But in reality, it would probably just been a small package. Some kind of Will Osprey 460, 360 splash kind of move. <laughs> ah, that kid's frighteningly talented. <laughs> well, what's worse about Will is I'm 15 years older than him. So he is that good and 22. And Jeez. every time I watch him, he does something else. I didn't realise he was that young. The first time he's done it and he'll do it perfectly. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mark of how dedicated he is to being... To being really, really good. Well, uh, well, we'll get on to Will Osprey a little bit later. Don't you mm. worry about that. But um, I want to get on to which I think maybe your first love, um, Leicester City. Yeah. <laughs> but um, apart from Leicester City, what is your first love, wrestling or comedy? Uh, it's difficult to say because comedy's my job now. I've been doing stand up for ten years. Um, if you'd have asked me three years in, it would have been. It would have been straight away. I would have been like three years into my comedy career when it still wasn't my full time job, and I still look forward to going on stage so much. Comedy would have just about won. I think it's a tie now, because comedy, much as I love it, and comedy has taken me all around the world, and I've got to do loads of great things and I've got to meet loads of cool people. Um, it is my job, and the, especially coming into December when most of my gigs will be Christmas gigs, and I will be entertaining people I don't particularly want to entertain. <laughs> um, you know, like this weekend, I mean, I mean, you're from Bristol, right? I, I, yeah. This weekend, I, I gigged in, in Bath at a club called Comedian, mm -hmm. and it's one of my favourite clubs. I love it there. And 
and, and that I look forward to certain clubs I look forward to going to and they're great um, but the the nature of my job is sometimes I'll do gigs and it is just the normal it's just the every gig's a 5 out of 10 uh, I'm trying my best but audiences are, are audiences and I can't force them to like me any more than they do so, so and the travel and everything makes it a little bit tiresome whereas with wrestling it's it's at a point where everything I do is fun everything I've done with progress has, has worked so I, I really look forward to every single show. I mean, obviously, we're, we're chatting midweek and we've got a show on Sunday. Mm-hmm. And then we've got a show the following Sunday. And the idea of us having two shows in a week is is brilliant for me because it means I'll, I'll you know, I don't sleep leading, leading up to shows because I get really excited. Um, <laughs> and, you know, even now, three and a half years in, you know, we're coming up to our 20, 23rd main show. Yeah. I still get that excited. Like, everything... Every time we do a show, I just think it's it, it, it's it's amazing. And I, every single show I turn up, um, I turn up thinking, oh, I wonder if anyone will turn up today. <laughs> We've already sold out. I just I still panic. So oh, man. I, I I think at the minute, wrestling probably just about wins over comedy, which is um, just... which is something that yeah, which is something that I wouldn't have uh, I wouldn't have thought I would have said, you know, a couple of years ago. But and even just as a fan, like mm-hmm. when NXT's in town in December. I'll go to a couple of NXT shows as a fan and I'll enjoy it. Oh, you know? yeah, I'll be there too. I'll be yeah, there it's, too. It, it's, it's just, I don't think it, it doesn't show, even, I mean, with comedy, I find it difficult to watch comedy on television because it's my job. Yeah. With wrestling, I still watch everything. I haven't seen Survivor Series yet, so I'm going to watch that. Ooh. Don't tell me anything. I won't tell, tell you, I won't tell you anything. I won't tell you anything. <laughs> Do you know what? I've been so good today. I've barely looked at Twitter and I'm addicted to Twitter. And it, Listen, mate. Listen, I never watch it live, so I kind of, well, you know, hopefully no one from work's listening to this, but I kind of watch it at work um, sometimes <laughs> when I get a chance during the lunch break, you know, kind of fast forward uh, here, there and everywhere. But um, yeah, and um, so I have to wait till the next day. So I literally turn my phone off and don't chat to no one because obviously I'm getting all the fans and the listeners on the sh- of, of the show mm. tweeting and saying, oh, you know, did you see this? Guys, did you see this? I'm, you know, forgetting that I am actually in England and not in America with the rest of them. So, you know, we have to kind of, you know, hush, hush on that one. So I'll keep that hush. But um, first love, I would probably say for you would be Leicester City. Um, can you describe James Jamie Vardy in one word? Uh, bony. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you went thin, something He's like the thinnest that. professional athlete in the world. But he puts like, the burners I on include, the I include every marathon runner ever. <laughs> you look at you look at someone like and if you listen in America and you're thinking, who's Jamie Vardy? Um he's never likely to become a professional wrestler. <laughs> um I, I love him. I, I I love I love the fact that, that my football team, who are uh traditionally just not very good, <laughs> um, on top of the Premier League. It is it it's a quite ridiculous state of affairs it is it's like my the, the team i follow in the nfl is is the cleveland browns it's mm-hmm. like them being in the super bowl it is it's unexpected and and it's great um but because of the nature of of my job it means i don't get to see them very often mm-hmm. um however uh this coming saturday uh, we're playing manchester united yeah my team I'm, work, I'm working in liverpool and it's on television and if i watch it on tv and then leave for work I'll get to my gig with five minutes to spare, and that is happening. Oh, uh, yeah, got to be done. Unless, unless we're three 0 down at half time, <laughs> point it's definitely not happening, and I'll just go and be on time for work. It's be like screw it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, all right, uh, let's get on to progress then. Um, so um, you are the co-founder, co-owner of Progress with um, you know John Briley and, and Glenn Joseph. Um, so how did that come together? John used to be John used to work in comedy. John used to be my manager. Oh, wow. And I was doing the Edinburgh Fringe Festival in 2011, and we'd always talk about wrestling. And when you know big WWE pay per views were on, John would come up to Leicester, where I still lived in Leicester at the time. John would come to Leicester, and we'd watch the pay per views. Um, and we just most of our conversations would be about wrestling. 2011, we, in August 2011, we sat in our flat in Edinburgh, so we're living together there, and uh, we're watching PWG. I forget which PWG show it is. I'm sure it's one of the DDT tournaments. And we're watching a PWG show, and we're really enjoying it. About two hours in, John nudged me and said, we should run a wrestling show. And I went, yeah, right. And that was that. Uh, because once he gets an idea, he um, he's, he's, he tends to go with it. And because John and Glenn both live, I mean, Glenn came on board after, we didn't know Glenn at all. 
Like mm-hmm. Glenn came to Chapter One as a fan, and then asked if he could be part of the company, and we really liked him and went, "Yeah, you're a cool dude." So then there was three of us. Um, John is. I always, I'm always at pains to point this out. Like John owns more of the company than me and Glenn because he does more of the work. Mm-hmm. Like all the boring day-to-day admin of you know with spreadsheets and stuff like that. That's all John. I do, but we're all very hands-on company. You know, we've all got our own responsibilities within the company, and and we all we all sort of muck in and do stuff. We've got no staff. It's literally just three dudes. Like before I spoke to you today, I was uh, scheduling updates to the website for the rest of the week, like because that's something I can do. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and it just sort of went from there. The, the the idea was we'd run shows in London because it was it was a traditional thing that you couldn't run wrestling shows in central London. So um, we decided to see if we could prove it wrong. The one thing I am proud of, and I know I definitely did it, I came up with a name because we threw out lots and lots of names, and I'm such a big fan of Japanese wrestling mm-hmm. that I was coming up with words that I remember. I was watching a, a hustle video at the time, and I remember thinking, first of all, I want a name that can be capitalized at all times yeah. because I really I like that. Um, and uh, I remember thinking, what word? Because we wanted to do something that the word evolve was taken. And we wanted to do something that was was moving, re- trying to move British wrestling forward and trying to make people think of things differently than, you know, sort of Big Daddy and Giant Haystacks and all that sort of stuff. And that's where the word progress came from, which was, came luckily, came out of my brain. So that's you know, <laughs> my one, one contribution. That's a plus. <laughs> yeah, one contribution to the wrestling world is like, I named a company. Um, but, but yeah, it just came from us seeing, like, and going into chapter one, which was March 2012, we went into that thinking well if we sell a hundred tickets we'll be happy if we just don't lose a thousands and thousands of pounds we'll be happy mm-hmm. and as it turned out that sold out and then every show since has sold out and now we're at a silly point where we you know we sell out shows very quickly and next year we've got 19 main shows plus mm-hmm. trainee shows so it's it's quite something it's not what we expected we do we're, we're still very humble about it and anyone who's ever seen me at any of the shows will know I still have time to talk to everybody. I still, mm-hmm. I still find it amazing that that people spend their hard-earned money to to come and see us. Yeah, it's 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 very humbling indeed. So, um, obviously, you're in you know electric ballroom now. Um, you started out at the garage. What was mm. your first attendance number? First attendance was I think about three hundred and twenty. I think because we didn't know how much the venue held. The same when we first moved to the ballroom. Our first ballroom show, we had 640 there. Mm-hmm. And now our attendance is 700, and we can't get any more than that. And it'll probably be the similar thing in Manchester, our first show at the Ritz on December the 6th. We've sold it out, but we've based it around what the ballroom holds, and it might hold a bit more. So we might be able to tweak it up and, and push the attendance a bit going forward. Um, it's really weird that I'm so anal about attendance numbers as well. It's Because <laughs> the, 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 the prospect of... I think our last ballroom show, we had more people there than ever before because we sold some of our production space as well. Mm-hmm. So I think we had 730 at our last show, which is our biggest, technically our biggest attendance. Um, wow. Unless you count people watching us at Download Festival and stuff like that. So it's, um, yeah, it's I'm a, I'm a bit OCD with numbers. So I, I, I like the idea of us, uh, of us constantly sort of expanding and pushing the attendance by a few figures every time. But, you know, at the time we were told, we, we had very little reference of our British wrestling, genuinely. We didn't know how to put on a wrestling show. We went to watch some British wrestling shows. Mm-hmm. When Glenn came on board, Glenn knew a lot more about British wrestling than I did. Um, and now I, like, I, like, I know a lot now because I know most people who work in the industry in this country, whether they've worked for us or not. I've been to a lot of shows. Um, but I still, you know, it's, it was still, I, was, I knew everything. If you asked me questions about 1995 All Japan, I could have answered them. Mm-hmm. But if you'd have asked me, if you'd have asked me who, you know, the good wrestlers were in this country initially, you know, it required a lot of educating because it wasn't something that was as obvious to find out. Um, uh, so, yeah, if you'd have, when we did our first show, if you'd have said to me 315 people, we would have gone yes. And then, you know, we found it, we never thought we'd get more than 315 people. So to have doubled that is a bit, is a bit crazy, really. <laughs> Well, um, you've you know with d- during that success, um, obviously you've opened you know Projo, um, mm-hmm. your train you know training facility and um, uh, out of the garage now and Endeavor, which is um, you know um, I want to call it your shows for um, for the Projo talent, um, who Chuck Mambo happens to be one of them. I actually know his mum. Oh, excellent. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, through work purposes, I'm within business development, so I know his mum. Um, so yeah, um, 
which is quite weird. But at the same time, uh, what do you feel has been your your successes and any issues within starting up something like that? Um, obviously, mirror not mirroring, but you know, you see the image of the performance center in WWE and NXT and so on and so on. And mm. um, I don't know if there's a lot of people who have tried to do something like this. So, has there been any you know issues and what are your successes within that? I think the the biggest issue is, and again, I, I have less to do with the project than I do with Progress as a company. What I'll do is I will, um, I, I'll go to the Projo, and one thing I, I can't teach people how to wrestle. Mm. I can tell people what I would like to see out of them, because you, you, in some ways, I, I don't know why, but my opinion is respected because I'm a promoter. Um, but I can definitely tell them what I'd like to see, and I can tell them what I think will draw a crowd, draw interest, and make money. The thing I do at the Projo is I will often go along and teach people how to talk because I, believe it or not, I'm not a natural public speaker. I have a stutter and I got into comedy because I have nerves. So I go in and, and ever, whenever I'm in London, I'll go in and whether it's in a beginner's class or an advanced class, I'll, I'll try and do some exercises with them to get them to speak better. Um, you know, Glenn is an actor. So Glenn will go in and work with them with with character development and, and and other things and and i think that gives them a more rounded viewpoint than just this is how to bump mm -hmm. i think the the issue we had when we opened the school was it was john's idea. john john had the idea and wanted to have a school that was open every day because that's the way to make people better if you've got a class and it's it's for two hours on a friday and that's it then you're not going to attract loads and loads of new talent. You're not, you know, you'll have a core class of maybe six, seven people, and some of those will drop away. And it's not necessarily the most intense way of of learning to be a wrestler. You look at how most people learn in the states before the the performance center came along, and it was you'd go to a camp for for two weeks a month, in often in Canada, and that's how you would learn. And it would be intense, and you would you you'd learn as much as is humanly possible. I mean the the one of the main reasons for trying to set up the, the Projo and make it so intense and try and bring so many people through was that we had an eye on wanting to make our own talent because there's loads and loads of talent in this country. Mm -hmm. But eventually people will get called up to go to the United States or, or Japan. And we wanted it to be that we were helping and not just helping the British wrestling industry by having a successful main company, but also helping the British wrestling industry by trying to produce people in the right way. And everyone who's done the training work uh, for us at the Projo, so at the minute, Daryl Allen, uh, Danny Garnell, James Davis from London Riots, uh, they all uh, work at, on the, the training side of things down there. We've also got people who work a, a lot throughout the British, uh, the British industry, so Jonathan Windsor works down there, Eddie Dennis has helped out down there, Jimmy Havoc was our head trainer for a bit. So these are all people who were trained the right way mm -hmm. and are passing that training on in a, in a more intense way well, and don't get me wrong. There's plenty of schools. There's, there's plenty of schools that are open, you know, more than once a week. It's just in London, there wasn't one that was open every day. And the nature of people who live in London is that you can't always guarantee that you can go to training on a certain day. Yeah. You know, people are all over the place, and it just seems to be the thing that that worked best for us. And, and there's there's certainly pitfalls to it. There's the, the 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 biggest pitfall is it's London. It's not cheap to keep a school open. <laughs> so we always have to make sure that we've got we've got people coming in the doors and we've got other ways around it. So, you know, we don't just do training classes there. We do, um, we do sort of like very sort of kid friendly birthday parties there where we teach them the very, very basics like rolling and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's an extra way of us making sure that we can pay the bills. Uh, but most of the time it's been, it's been ticking over nicely and it's, it's been producing, it's been producing people who are talented. You mentioned Chuck Mambo before. He's very talented. Uh, Pastor William Eve is probably the most high profile of our, <laughs> yeah. um, our graduates who is, you know, phenomenally good. And what's quite nice is we, we are getting people uh, like Pastor, uh, like Sebastian, like Tom Irvin, um, who started their training a few years ago, sort of went away from it and then decided to come back to it. And we're the place they've decided to come back and hone everything. And that's... That's really nice. That's a nice pat on the back for us, us as a brand and also for us for our school's reputation. <laughs> Sebastian Keys. All right. So <laughs> I want to let you in on how I know about progress and how um, that managed to come around and how I think that you guys are really, really starting to make a, a massive, massive impact all over the country. So this is what happened. Okay. 
Right, so our show, um, you know, we've been going for two and a half years uh, and I'm so lucky to have, you know, so a, a core group of uh, wrestling fans and a core group of listeners. Um, just so happen to be in London, um, two names, um, Steve Dawson and Tony Warner, uh, who go to every single progress show. Now, I have, you know, I was at the time, I'd never been to any um, indie shows, any British shows, anything like that. Um, now, these guys were always, they were coming on the show, they were helping us when we were in a bit of a dip. Um, mm. at the time and um, these guys are always talking about progress like oh you should go to progress um, you know um, we should have meetups and yada 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 and this that and this that um, now we started to schedule some meetups uh, we called it segue meetups where we had uh, f- listeners from all over the country come and, and meet up uh, and then we decided to go and see wrestling shows so I decided okay I'm going to go to London meet these guys and I'm going to go to a progress show so what happened was we ended up going to pr- uh, chapter 20 uh, nice now for me it was a big deal because they 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 let me know about the story between you know jimmy havoc and um, and with osprey um and i was pretty much amped excited looking forward to go so then i reached down to camden and there's this massive line with people you know people from here there and all there everywhere and i was just excited um had some some bang bang chicken from outside um yeah. <laughs> got in um and just saw how the place was filling up filling up filling up um star wars music starts <laughs> And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. And out you come. And uh, yeah, the rest was history. I mean, seeing um, Pastor William Eva, you know, face up against Noam Dar in the first match and so on and so on. It just kind of built from there. Seeing the Hunter Brothers against, um, you know, SDS and all of that. Um, the Thunder Bastard, my first Thunder Bastard, you know, kind of experience. And to, you know, to um, the main event. I mean, that was just off the chain completely um and then even to the part where you're in the ring your wife she's getting a haircut and i'm like oh yeah whoa you know what i mean like this is this is so good you know what i mean i put money in the bucket um and um uh i left there feeling so um what's the word just energized me it just just energized i i couldn't believe that this was something that was going on and and uh you know i wasn't privy to this and now i'm here and i want to come back and you know i was just thankful that these guys you know who who speak your name very highly i mean steve dawson's met you before um i think you did a show a uh, comedy show after one of your endeavor shows or something something like that there was a show that you did down there i, I know i know steve when you mentioned his name i was like yeah he's a cool dude <laughs> yeah um so they, these guys speak your name all the time in such good light um so and we continue to do it as well and i do it over here i keep saying to people get pro- uh, progress on demand get progress on demand make sure you check that out because um it's one thing watching it there but you need to go there and watch it um so that's how you guys came about for me i will definitely be attending again um don't you worry about that um but i've got some other stuff in the pipeline which i will speak to you guys about after but um that's that's how i think that you guys are making impacts you know impacts in the country i think what's what's nice is i'm sitting there listening to this and it makes me smart right because (laughs) a big part of I think the, the the way to be successful as a wrestling company, it, it, WWE doesn't doesn't matter because WWE will always be a success. It will have peaks and troughs, but it will always be a success. It is the market leader. Same as in Japan, New Japan will always be a success. It's the market leader. It's never going to go away. With an indie company, I think what you need to do is you need to have a sense of identity and you need to have a reason to choose that indie company over over other companies. And 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 that is how you 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 take the steps to um, to to be in a, 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 as hopefully as successful as we are. And I think the main reason for our success is it's twofold. One, the wrestling on our shows is is great. The wrestling on nearly every British independent show is great. You know that is that's we work really hard at putting storylines together and trying to come up with trying to build matches in the right way. But we don't. You know we know that what we do is good but equally i go to plenty of other british independent shows you know i go to pcw and Southside and and shows like that and they're great you know they're, they're great we get the wrestling right but the thing you hit the nail on the head there with is ever since we started and this is partly because i'm a comedian who's used to trying to make atmosphere nice atmospheric gigs we wanted the atmosphere to how ha- to make it feel that you couldn't ever miss it because you'd feel that all your friends were going to a party and you weren't there yeah that, and and that is that's how we wanted to make it feel. I mean, I, I've I've started using the word ultras to describe our fans because I'm really into football. I've been all around the world watching football, and when I stand in the ring at the Electric Ballroom, I feel 
it's the equivalent to me. If I was a footballer um, standing in front of the yellow wall at Borussia Dortmund, it's it's the fans are so loud and so enthusiastic and yet so friendly and welcoming. So if you've never been to a show before, all of a sudden you've got 699 new best mates. Mm -hmm. And that, it's, you know, part of it is down to us working hard to make sure the atmosphere is built in the right way. But part of it's organic. We've just, we've hit a load of cool people all at the same time. And it's, it's, it's just, every show I walk out and think, this is great. Because I don't, with comedy, I can go out and sometimes I have to entertain people I don't like. I don't have that problem with wrestling. Like every progress show, everyone in the audience is someone I'd probably be friends with. Yeah. It's, it's you know, it's not a, it's not an act. It's all three of us feel that way. All three of us are, are delighted that we have that atmosphere at every show, and it is the atmosphere combined with how talented the British wrestling scene is at the moment that I think keeps you know keeps bringing people back. And it's long may it continue. I always worry. If you ever see me at ringside, I, I'm always worried if. If the atmosphere dips a little bit, my job is to make sure the atmosphere lifts again. So it's always, I'm always concerned about what the atmosphere is like and making sure that um, everybody's happy. And if you know, if ever, I hate the idea of everyone, anyone not enjoying themselves at one of our shows. So people know they can talk to me about it. You know, if they've got a problem, they don't like something, they can tell me. Even if it's to do with booking. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I won't. Yeah, you know, I won't ever apologise for how we book shows because most people now trust us to know that even if they don't like the finish of something, it's probably going to pay off in a cool way in the end. They just have to be patient with it. So most people get that now. Um, but yeah, even if people have a problem with that, I'll, I'll listen to it. I, I won't. I won't tell them they're right and I'm wrong. But I will at least listen to why people don't like something because you've got to listen to the fans. If you listen to the fans, the experience is is as great as possible for as many people and I hate the idea of anyone going away from one of our shows and thinking nah, maybe I'll give it a miss next month, I don't want that to happen, I want everyone to go, I am desperate to do this again, why isn't this happening more that's why we've got to a position where we can do shows monthly next year and in Manchester every two months because, because people like what we do, but we can't ever get complacent and just put our feet up and go, oh well we've cracked this now you know everything's fine. The atmosphere will be fine at the show. Let's just not worry about it. Let's just all let's all play video games and not think about. No, no, you've got to work hard at everything to make it. You know, right now, I mean, on my drive to, I'm in London at the minute. On my drive to London this morning, I've got about half past five to drive to London. And on my drive into London, I was thinking about um, thinking about a couple of things I want to say at the start of the show on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, relating to a, a fan of ours called Leon Webster who who passed away, and I want to say something about it. But I don't want to say something about it in a negative way. Mm -hmm because the, our fans were so lovely to him in his last couple of days on the planet that I want to talk about that and talk about the sense of community that we've had. And I know that I know that I want to thank the fans for what they do, but I also know that they will get on board and be excited about the fact that they played a big part in someone's life. And it's that, you know, there's not many wrestling promoters who go out and talk about stuff like that. You know, I, when I started, I just go out and, you know, take the mickey out of people for a row, <laughs> and now it's like, I know I have to go out and thank people, and and the, it does feel like we have the most loyal fans. You know, we're, we've got, I think it's five or six people now have got progress tattoos. Oh, now, wow. bearing in mind, I'm a heavily tattooed man. I yeah. haven't got one yet. So, <laughs> you know, like people, and like these, are, we're not talking little tiny ones. We're talking like whole of their forearm, dedicated Jeez. to a wrestling company that's been going three and a half years. That is crazy. Make sure you stay tuned for part two with Jim Smallman next week on the Sunday Segway Wrestling Podcast. And if you don't like that, you can choke on that. Slap nuts. Woo!